Oh, hey, I'm Coco, and welcome to our talk show, Single and Too Tired to Mingle. We'll be talking about relationships with ourselves, our exes, our kids, and other important beings. So stay tuned. Hi, Ricky. How are you doing today? Hey, Coco. Delighted to join you. And good evening to you and good morning to us because you're dialing in from Melbourne. Australia is the most inconvenient place in the world. I'm so excited though because I used to live in Melbourne when I was a child. <laughs> so it's very nice to chat to you. Um, so just a quick introduction. So we're speaking to uh, Ricky Aronson today. So you are an endocrinologist, um, a geriatrician. You are also an author of a book called Men, no, women are superior to men. Uh, and you're a father of four children and also a husband. Anything yeah, you would fact, like the to add? Four children even come to the same wife, allegedly. So <laughs> just to make that clear to the listeners. Okay, that's uh, good to know, probably for you more than others. <laughs> All right, so I'm really excited to host you today. I think the conversation is going to be really um, interesting. So we have a, an endocrinologist and a geneticist here chatting together. Um, so why don't we just open up with kind of what does um, an endocrinologist do? So endocrinologists are specialist doctors who manage hormones and glands. So we, I think one of the most common things we manage is diabetes, but also thyroids, osteoporosis, all kinds of glandular problems, but also hormones. So we manage men with testosterone problems, women with hormonal problems. Um, and there's quite a lot of interesting conditions that go along with those things. In a nutshell. <laughs> um, and kind of, are men and women different? And how are they different if they are? Wow, that's, that's a big question to start with. Um, yes, I mean, we're living through very difficult political times where um, talking about basic biology almost becomes controversial, which is, which is really a strange place to find ourselves because things weren't like this five years ago. So putting all the politics aside, there certainly are many similarities between men and women, and there's far more uh, there's far more about us that is the same because we're all human and we all have the same needs for for love and care, and we have sensitive egos and all the things that men have, women have, and vice versa. So I think what tends to happen in discussions about about men and women is that we tend to focus on the things that are different, and in relationships, those are often the things that become a flashpoint. For conflict, because you don't fight about the things that are the same. Both of you need love. You're not going to fight about the fact that you need love on average. So the things that are quite different about men and women, um, well, for moment, hormonally, we're certainly very different. And that has significant influence on behavior because testosterone is a very powerful and dominant hormone on earth that does a lot of things to men. Um, and um, with women, for example, menstrual cycles, women are quite aware that when their hormones change, that has significant effects on mood. It can have significant effects on libido and all sorts of things. And those are only the hormonal issues, which are really just scratching the surface because there are also differences in the way our brains work in certain ways. And also, I think without being controversial, we do have different physical equipment. And I think probably most profoundly, we the, the human race depends on men and women playing different roles for the survival of humanity. Um, men simply can't fall pregnant. They can't breastfeed babies. And until very recently, the technology of having contraception and um, bottle feeding were not available to humanity. So, so women have played the role of nurturers for young children, and they're incredibly well genetically adapted to that role. It's actually a very beautiful thing that seems to be quite denigrated nowadays, that, that women are just amazing mothers. And they specifically designed to be amazing mothers because we depend on that as a species for survival. So that's a very, that's actually the shortest thoughts because there's a much, there's obviously a lot of detail in there. Yeah. Thanks for that. Um, so you wrote a book titled women are superior to men. So where did you get the inspiration to write this book? Um, and how are women superior? <laughs> wow. So that's another huge question. Um, I actually have a, an unusual backstory. There's no tragedy in it, fortunately, which is, I guess, unfashionable. But um, in medicine, I have always been very interested in the management of people and the fact that doctors are not always taught 
how to manage people and how to manage relationships. And of course, any career that you do is very dependent on how you relate to other people. So I started running leadership courses for doctors on how to manage people, how to manage teams, how to relate to patients better, how to relate to their colleagues better and themselves. And those courses were, became quite popular. And I, I became a, a director of a, a portfolio, which was called Medical Leadership and Mentoring, taking care of other doctors who were in need and teaching doctors how to handle humans better. Um, and my wife decided to come to one of my courses. Um, and she, she was very disparaging. She said, ah, oh, it'll be boring. I'm sure I won't learn anything. And then she came to the course and there were about 50 specialists there and she absolutely loved it. And she walked out of it and she said, you have to write a book. And I said, me? Why me? She said, because people are interested in what you have to say. Okay. So I started writing on a, a lot of different subjects and they were all very much centered on relationships and conflict management. And I wrote everything from humor to serious things to all kinds of topical things in a very unfocused way. I wrote for sort of a year and I wrote thousands and tens of thousands of pages on all kinds of subjects. And then I was sitting on a ward with some nurses and they were all calling their husbands during their dinner break and they were getting very grumpy. And the one nurse said, you know, why do I have to call my husband every night to tell him to feed the baby? I mean, doesn't he know that you have to feed the baby? And then the next wife goes, yes, I just don't understand it. I spend my whole meal break giving instructions to my husband. Doesn't he know by now what the kids need in the evening? And I was just laughing and I turned to them and I said, yeah, you know, you, you, you all expect too much. Don't you know that women are superior no, to men? <laughs> so they started laughing and they said, you know, that's brilliant. You should write a book about that. So I, I, mean, I, I had been writing a lot generally about relationships, so it kind of gave me focus. And then I did that as sort of a first step in my author journey was, thought that's a great place to start because it's entertaining and funny and you can be really positive in the space. And I, I think there's too many people being negative about the fact that many men and women actually like each other quite a lot in relationships. And we don't have to have such a negative world where this is seen as such a, a negative relationship. Yeah, I agree. Oh, great story. but. Um... Should men not know what to give their children for dinner? <laughs> yeah, it's a very interesting. It's a very interesting thing. I mean, it's again. You, you, I mean, it's a very valid question. I think it's fair to say that women are, on average, have many mothering instincts that men have to work harder at. That's that's been my experience of men and women. That there's nothing to stop men being great fathers, and we should be great parents, and we should help our wives. I have a question. <laughs> The term help our wives, what do you mean by that? You're not helping your wife, you're living with her as an equal partner. Because a lot of men say, I help my wife. It's like My wife becomes antagon antagonized if any man uses the term babysitting and she goes, but it's your own kids, you can't babysit. So, exactly. so maybe my choice of words were poor and I'll take them back. I think taking care of wives though isn't really a, a, a term that necessarily implies that um, you're doing your wife a favor by looking after the kids. I mean, in any relationship, not this is making a very serious answer to a question. I think it wasn't that serious, but not to take this to a dark place. But I think yeah. the, the the very most important aspect of happy relationships is for each partner to be taking proper care of the other one. And when it comes to parenting, that goes for men and women alike. It's a very challenging, difficult time of life, which which creates a lot of pressure because you suddenly have this new dynamic, having been in love with each other, you have a, a third wheel who's very, very demanding and requires an enormous amount of energy and time. So I think men and women both need to take care of each other's needs during that time. And part of that is men stepping up the plate and being really good dads and being really good husbands, because that's really what they should be doing. And that's what love is, taking care of the other person. Nicely put, Ricky. <laughs> um... So what makes a good marriage work? So taking care of each other, anything else in your experience? Well, I think the first thing, the most important thing in a marriage is actually that each partner takes care of the needs of the other. And that's very broad okay. because taking care of the needs of the other person is all about how you talk to them, how you give to them emotionally, sex, intimacy, affection. But really, the perfect marriage is one in which each partner 
concerns themselves primarily with the needs of the other, then both people are going to be deliriously happy because they're both uh-huh. taken care of. And and so I guess that's the the, the, the major thing in marriage is, is really making sure that your partner's happy. And, and we, we do have, on average, two human beings brings together two complex universes of different emotions and needs and emotional baggage. And so it's never going to be the case that both people need exactly the same things at the same time. And I think one of the challenges to marriage in the modern day, which is causing a lot of divorce and causing a lot of strife, is that we live through times which promote narcissism and everyone is being told, you should be worried about yourself and what you need. And the difficulty with that equation is that when you only worry about what you need, then you don't make a good marriage partner or relationship partner. You're not going to get what you need because ultimately that's going to infect the relationship because the other person's not going to feel cared about and that's going to everything will go down from there so i guess my my answer to you is really it is about being primarily concerned with making the other person happy and well cared for yeah so instead of each one looking at each other what they need themselves kind of focus the attention on on the other person so what about for example hollywood relationships and uh, rom-coms that we so eagerly watch um and think that that's kind of how it should be because it's so, so, so prevalent in the media. Well, I think the whole relationship between the media and humanity has it becomes ever more complex. I've actually got a book, a chapter in my book called Don't Believe Hollywood um, right. because I talk about the fact um, it isn't actually all about love because Hollywood has this notion that two people fall in love and love will conquer all. Yes. But love actually yes. doesn't work like that. Love takes hard work. And it's not just about falling in love. It's it's about whether you share values. It's about whether you talk about those values. It's about whether you can find common ground in the way you want to interact with each other. And so I think this idea of just falling in love with someone because they have a beautiful body and a beautiful face, I mean, sounds very appealing to me right now, to be honest. But in real life, that's lust and it's not love. And, and Hollywood portrays this idea that lust is the nature of or, or the basis of love. And really, yeah. physical attraction yeah. is beautiful and it's important. And it's something that makes us want to spend a lot of time with someone who we don't know. So it's a very powerful, yeah. chemical, attracting bond between us. But after that, the work starts. You've got to get to know what the other person thinks, what they like, what their values are, and make sure that you actually are compatible and you want to take care of each other and that relationship will work. Yeah. I think even with sexuality, something very interesting has happened. And that is that on the screen, everyone's always screaming and shrieking and, you know, immense continual continual pleasure. And sexuality is portrayed as this thing that is constantly, you know, the most spectacularly pleasurable event in life. But in real life, of course, people have better and worse sexual days and experiences and the days when they're more or less in the mood and where things go better or go worse. And again, it's about hard work. A, a happy sex life actually takes work. It's about sometimes someone's not so much in the mood, but they know what their partner really needs and they go, hey, because I love you, I want you to be happy and I know this is what's going to make you happy. So I'm going to give that to you in the same way that we do that in other ways in a relationship. It's not a transactional relationship, but it's actually all about, yeah. I want to take care of you and I want to make you happy. And part of that is having a ha- happy sex life and sometimes that means that one person does a bit more of something they don't want to do quite as much as the other person or vice versa. And as long as the relationship works in a way that both partners are so committed to giving the other person what they need, it's not about a transactional or a negative thing. So I think that's the, the pro- what I was going to say It's interesting about Hollywood is that there are a lot of young people are having a lot of sexual dysfunction now because they see the images on screen of what sex is supposed to be. But then yeah. when they actually have sex, they find it doesn't. It isn't actually like that. I mean, it's awesome, but sometimes it isn't. And the challenges are around yeah. it, and the emotional challenges are around it. And they have this idea from watching movies that it should always be just amazing and easy. And so, even from the get go, from the first time, yeah, I find that too. Like immediately, everything needs to click. It needs to be amazing. Everyone needs to be happy. And it's not really like that in real life. But that's what kids see. So, how are they going to learn what's actually real and what's Hollywood? There again is a huge challenge of the internet. And I think one of the things that is happening now is that a lot of kids get their sexual information from the internet and from porn and often quite um, 
what quite um, unhealthy uh, sexual images and, and sexual acts that they see and then start to believe that those things are normal. So I think for parents, it is quite important to talk openly with children about sexuality. Now, and I'm not talking about small children. I'm talking about kids that are old enough that their friends are talking about it at school. Right. And, and that age is probably too young, but parents have to sit with their kids and talk about healthy sexuality and, and actually ensure that they're getting the right kind of information instead of something which can often be quite perverse. It's a very difficult challenge for parents. Yeah, I was going to say, how do parents actually sit down and do that with their kids? Like, I find I'm quite an open parent and they can come to me for anything. Um, like I write in the book, my older child actually asked me when he was maybe 13, 14, he goes, mother, what does sex feel like? Right? So what a question to get. Um, so I just explained to him when it's something with someone you love, it should be nice and great. When it's someone that you don't, it's probably not as good. But luckily, he never took a step forward to actually ask, or luckily, I don't know, like details of, I don't know, how to do it or whatever. Like, I don't know what I would have said, despite the fact that I have a really open relationship with my two sons. So... My kids, for some reason, have decided that even though their dad has written a book on relationships and sexuality, that they can only ask their mother these questions. Right. So right. they speak to my wife, and I know there's a great conversation between my oldest son and my wife. He was probably about 10 at the time, and he's, he's quite a smart kid, and he went to his mom, and he wanted to understand where babies come from, and he was kind of getting it. And then he was very intrigued, and he said, okay, I get this part about the dad giving a seed to the mom and that going into a womb and making the baby. And he said, but the part I'm not getting is how does the seed get from the dad <laughs> to the mom's womb? It's a very common question. And then my wife was like, well, and then eventually she told him and he just, go, he just goes, you've ruined my childhood. <laughs> Often kids just go, disgusting. Like now they have an image in their mind they can't get rid of. <laughs> Yeah, but you've got to tell them if they ask, like, what are you going to do? <laughs> I think if they're old enough to be asking that question, they're probably old enough to get some kind of reasonable answer, even if it's a yeah, little bit censored in terms of detail. So tell me, it's like a little bit of a change of uh, discussion. Why do, in drownings, why do 80% of men, of, of the drowned people, why are 80% of the men and only a fraction women? Look, I think, again, this is... <laughs> We have this, this very fraught gender war going on in society now where we have the attempt to brainwash everyone that men and women are exactly the same and think and act exactly the same. When really yeah. when you look around you, it's clear that that's not the case. And in fact, there are lots of studies about how male and female risk-taking behavior differs because they're not the same. And men are much less interested in following rules than women. And they tend to be much more risk-taking on average than women. Not that whether you don't get girls that are risk-taking as teenagers, you certainly do, but men are the worst. And I think the way that you always see this in classrooms is girls always uh, saying, why can't the boys in the class just listen to the teacher and the boys are all running amok and doing crazy things. And unfortunately, when it comes to drowning, that is what happens. Men are the ones who jump into the water drunk. They're also the ones who break their necks in swimming pools. I mean... I don't know how I, in medicine, I've met plenty of men who've jumped into swimming pools, drunk and broken their necks. I haven't yet met a woman who's done it. And I'm sure there are some who have, but it's men who tend to be greater risk takers and in life generally, and push the boundaries harder often than, than women do on average. And, and I think there are lots of good reasons why we are that way. But I think one of the very beautiful things about women is that if you look at the average 18 year old male or female, you know, an 80-year-old male is really quite a useless character on average. They, you know, punching each other on the shoulder and drinking beer and shouting bad language. And you meet a lot of 18-year-old women who are actually very mature adult people with very sensible, you know, behavior. And yet somehow other men and women come together. Women love the excitement of men. And the, the fact is a lot of women go for bad guys because they like that excitement and that slightly dangerous air that men get from testosterone. And then... They refine that, and a few years later, you have a great husband who's actually really caring for his wife and his children, and he's not that beer-drinking idiot that this, this girl was attracted <laughs> to. That's the nurturing role that I think women are really good at bringing out the best in other people. I think, they've, I think generally, I mean, you're an interviewer. 
bring out the best in the people you're interviewing. So it's it's a it's a really fantastic role I think that women play naturally in society, and I I don't think it's a a gender stereotype or a socialized issue. It's literally what they're designed to do is bring out the best in kids and bring out the best in families. And if you think about the average marriage, how often have we all heard men doing crazy things and girlfriends and wives going, just calm down, just, just stop what you're doing, think about your family. It's not a line you often hear men saying to women, I'm sorry to say, like it just isn't. Is it nature versus nurture? For example, are girls told, oh, just be a good girl, you know, girls don't behave like this um, and boys are just, you know, allowed to do whatever or run loose or is it pure or is it down to nature? I think the days of, of, of men telling women just be a good girl. I mean, not I men. Uh, no, no. I mean, parents. I, I haven't seen that for years. I mean, that's, I think, a very outdated way to bring up kids. I don't think that exists in society anymore. Everything's now you go, girl. So yeah, that's I think that uh, <laughs> those, those days have long passed. But we haven't seen the kind of, uh, uh, and I think this is something Jordan Peterson often says, when you actually look at studies of societies, you don't actually see these major uh, sociological changes occurring when you have very egalitarian upbringing in society. You still see pronounced differences in the way men and women behave. In fact, even more so, the more egalitarian the upbringing, which is interesting. Um, just as we touched on Jordan Peterson, another interesting thing he said, and maybe I can relate to this, <laughs> is like, why is it so hard for highly educated, let's say, successful women to find men versus highly educated, successful men finding their spouses a little bit easier? Is that true or not? Well, having never been a highly successful woman myself, I haven't really been out there and dating many highly successful men. I, I do think, though, and this is going to, I, I, I mean, look, there certainly are men who do feel threatened by strong women. I think that's true. I think there are many men who don't feel threatened by strong women. Um, and I guess it's also, it does depend what men are looking for. And that's a challenge because there are some men who actually still are looking for a stay-at-home mom or someone who's going to, you know, they feel going to fulfill a role that they want in their marriage. And there are other men who don't feel that. But I guess the difficult challenge then for those women is if you've got a certain percentage of men who are not looking for a powerful sort of um, uh, strong, you know, female lead in their marriage, that that narrows the field a bit. So I don't know. I think the thing is that um, this is a very unfashionable statement, and I apologize, but it just is true. But it's it. Women are definitely attracted to more diverse features in men than men are in women. So men are very yeah. looks orientated, whereas women are often attracted to charisma and power and wealth. And if you look at 90-year-old women who are wealthy, they don't have 20-year-old hot boyfriends very often, yeah. but the other way around they do. So this is just a way that you can, uh, you can say it's nature or nurture, but it certainly is nevertheless a feature of, of society. Ricky, as an endocrinologist, is there a difference between gender and sex? Typically, we use the terms interchangeably, but is that the right way to use the terms or is there an actual difference to them? Well, as an endocrinologist, we don't really um, deal with that as a medical term in that sense, in that at the moment, a lot of the medical bodies in the world have decided that there is a difference between gender and sex. Um, and that's been a, I think, politically and populist driven idea because in reality, most people, for most people, sex and gender are the same thing. It's clear that for some people that they are different, but for most people, they're the same. And I think that that's what's been lost in this, this massive politicization of sexuality and gender is that 99 point, uh, it's a very, very high percentage, it's about 99.9, 99.8% of people, their sexuality and gender are the same thing. And they respond to their biology and whether they're gay or straight, they're actually um, very biologically in sync between sexuality and gender. And whilst some people yeah. may be different to that, I think that the fact that we've now moved to dismiss the congruence, the con, well, the, the dismiss the fact that the two for most people are the same, is creating a lot of challenge. It creates a lot of challenge in medicine, and it creates a lot of right. challenge socially. 
And I think what I would say to that is, there is absolutely no issue tolerating people who are different. And it's clear that for some people who have gender dysphoria, that they don't feel that their um, sexuality is their gender. And for those people, we need to take care of them. We need to support them. We need to ensure that they don't feel threatened and they get whatever medical care they need and psychological care to get the best outcome. But in saying that for most people, most men and women are actually men and women as the way they were born and respond to their right. hormones and their biology in a certain way. And I don't think that we should politicize that because it's actually the way we are genetically and biologically. I don't think it's positive to cancel biology for politics. It's, it's never taken society to a good place. And it has nothing to do with right. science. Why do we tend to believe kind of social media and media in general over science or facts? Well, I think one of the problems is, as has happened many times in history, uh, scientific bodies and doctors jump on the bandwagon like everyone else because humans are all human and they respond to affirmation right. and peer pressure. And when everyone's saying something and you know you're going to get lots of positive attention for saying it, you say it as well. And people are very scared to speak out against things that everyone else is saying because there is, uh, at the moment, certainly a lot of negativity about speaking out against certain ideas. And I think that it's right. become a very unnecessarily adversarial space because what really is the case factually is that we have a huge number of people for whom sex and gender are the same thing and for right. whom sexuality and gender are extremely biological. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's the way they were designed. Then we have another group of people for whom there is con internal conflict over those issues who are unhappy or uncomfortable with their sexuality and feel different to that. And those people need to be treated like human, like as humans, like everyone else, get the care they need, get the support they need. And there's no judgment in that. And I don't believe we become a more tolerant society by canceling biology. I think we can accept both constructs and they can live very happily beside each other. It's a very odd philosophy anyhow. Because in medicine, we take care of people who have things that are different or not the same as other people. So when someone gets cancer, they're suffering from a condition that is different to other people. And we take care of them because they need care. And if we see someone in clinic who has issues related to sexuality or gender, because it could be either, lots of people who are heterosexual have sexual issues and there's all kinds of issues around it. Our job is to take care of those people non-judgmentally and give them the best outcome possible. And so I, I don't really see the distinction and I don't see the need to cancel biology and pretend that men and women are exactly the same and that there's no such thing as, sec uh, as congruence between sexuality and gender. It's not consistent with the world we see around us. It's, in fact, it's not yeah. consistent with reality, yeah. put it that way. Thanks for that. Okay, um, maybe just as kind of like a final question. Why do Mer- That's a very why serious do Mer question. <laughs> that was, but this one's not going to be that serious. <laughs> Although maybe it is, I don't know. Um, so research shows us that married men live longer than married women. Why is that? <laughs> Ooh, okay. I'll give you the funny answer and then I'll give you the boring answer. Okay. So the funny Let's answer is that we like to think that Men who get married live longer than men who stay single because they get fantastic care from their wives. And there's certainly some truth in that. As a geriatrician, we know we have a lot more problems with elderly men who are living alone often than elderly women. They just can't take care of themselves. And they, a lot of them, not all of them, but some of them just fall into squalor. Whereas there's a lot of independent old elderly ladies out there taking fantastic care of themselves. And the reason why women live shorter is because when they're single, they live longer. When they're married, their husbands wear them out. And all that care from their husbands is exhausting. I think probably more true to that statistic is a boring answer. And that is that I think women who get married are more likely to have babies. And having pregnancy, first of all, carries a certain health risk to women. Having babies carries a health risk to women. So even just having a baby versus not having babies would, would carry a, you know, a, a worse survival and also, there's all kinds of medical consequences of having babies, unfortunately. So women get issues with fetus return from their lower bodies and, uh, you know, 
Also, women gain a lot of weight often from epigenetic change after having pregnancy. So they're epigenetic changes that change the body to store energy a lot better to feed the baby. So I think there are a lot of factors there. And also, women, this is going to be a very unfashionable statement. Women are very good genetic selectors. Oh, that's so, true, actually. <laughs> if you look at the animal kingdom, you know, the women yeah. stand by and they watch the men fight and they're like, that one's got good genes. He just beat the other one that's up. That's it. And within humanity, women sit by in bars and clubs and parties and social events and they're looking and they're going, that one's got good genes, I'll have that one. So the men who don't get married may live shorter than the men who do because the strong, strapping, healthy men are the ones getting married and the ones that are, you know, unfortunately less advantaged genetically often are the, the least likely to get married. So and I don't hold that against women, that is the way genetic selection works and it affects humans right. as much as everyone else. Women are looking to marry the best genetic pick that they can to give them good kids. I actually write about that in my book as well. <laughs> I think that's what happened with my ex. I'm like, yeah, that one's got good genes and the kids are amazing. So I think I did well on that front. <laughs> Big win there. Oh, Ricky, very good conversation. A lot of new things uh, that we've learned here. Is there like a takeaway that you could give to our viewers and listeners today? There is actually something very nice that I'd like to say, and that is that we live in times that people are so adversarial about everything, and we have all this negativity about men and women and patriarchies and you know toxic masculinity. Toxic masculinity. But actually, if you if you step away from that for a moment, you will find that since time immemorial, uh, Charles Dickens and Shakespeare and you know, the Bible wrote about men falling in love with women and women falling in love with men. And that's actually something very beautiful for many people in the world that women make amazing wives and mothers and men make amazing dads and fathers. And many of us have benefited from that and from the magic of two people coming together who come with all of their differences and complexities, fall in love and, you know, to all the difficulties that they face in their lives and the obstacles, they stay together and they still love each other 50 years later. It, you know, there's something very magical and beautiful about that. And I don't think we should lose sight of that dream and lose sight of that aspiration. And it has nothing to do with tolerating people who are different, which we should also do, but we shouldn't become so negative about happy heterosexual relationships. That was beautiful, Ricky. Thank you so much. <laughs> My pleasure. Thank you for your time. I really enjoyed hosting you. Uh, and I hope that you enjoyed being a guest as well. It's been absolutely fantastic. I look forward to meeting you someday in person, Coco. You're a, you're a star. I hope your podcast does really well. Oh, thank you so much. And um, I wish you a very lovely evening. 